Let's just pray, folks, for a moment. Lord Jesus, we ask you to come and be with us this morning, as only you can be, as the great peacemaker. Bring peace to our hearts, bring peace amongst us, and bring peace to the world. We ask that you would speak to both the hearer and the speaker alike this morning. In your name, amen. So I heard a few weeks ago in a news conference a question asked, and it stuck with me really as I've watched events unfolding in the United States of America. A journalist in the room asked a very powerful man, will you commit to the peaceful transfer of power? Seemed like a very decent question to ask, and I'm sure that's resonating with some of you listening as to the context of this question. The individual responded with his shoulders thrown back and his head held high. No, definitely not. Disappointing answer for many who were watching and broke hearts around the world. For don't we all look for peace in our world leaders? Don't we look for a sense of a deep abiding calmness about them in the midst of the storm? And as we face COVID-19, we look for that even more from our friends, neighbours, but most poignantly from those in leadership. We look for peace between our nations. We look for peace in our world. And we long for kindness, love, compassion to reign amongst the nations. It's easy to see what the theme of this sermon is based on Matthew 5, but I hope that passage in Ephesians this morning was familiar to many who are listening, if not, get your Bible out and have a reread. It's a very rich and detailed passage. At first, hard to understand, but as I've dwelt with it over the last two years, would you believe, it begins to speak powerfully into the life of the church. Have you ever played the game of word association, where somebody says a word and you say the first thing that comes into your mind? I don't know, chocolate? sure some of the people in the room could answer that with me. What comes into mind? Let's play that game a little bit together for the moment. What's the opposite? So say I say um, forgiveness. What would be the opposite to forgiveness? Lack of forgiveness and kindness. So let's play a word association game of opposites. So when I say love, what would be the opposite word or the opposite sentiment? Compassion. Gentleness. Kindness. And peace. When I think of those words, love, kindness, compassion, and gentleness, peace and kindness, I don't like the opposite words, for they're not what I long for the world to be and what I long for the church that I love so much and for the communities that I serve. So here's the first question. What does it mean to be people of peace? What does it mean for us as individuals, for our places of worship and for our communities of Ruscombe, Twyford and Hurst to become dwelling places for God's peace? in the world. Matthew 5 verse 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. If you read that passage in Ephesians 3, 13 to 12, 22, peace is mentioned four times in total in the passage, so significant in the writing of this particular part of scripture. And it struck our steering group as we spent time in that passage in Ephesians. It struck our home groups as they spent time dwelling in that passage in Ephesians. That the word peace seems so prominent. Peace amongst you, peace within you, and peace around you. But Jesus also refers to peace in the Beatitudes, of course. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. The more I read the Beatitudes, the more I see how radical they really are and how significant they have been throughout generations and will be going forward in the future. They spoke as powerfully then through the mouth of Jesus as they speak today into our world. 
For the Beatitudes speak of the coming of a new kingdom, of a different way to be, a different space to occupy, a different way to view the world and to view the most vulnerable amongst us. They talk about the reign of Christ the King. Today we think about that, Jesus as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Today in the life of the church is when we traditionally mark Jesus as King. And his framework, his manifesto for being King of the world and the nations is surely the Beatitudes. They give a framework for social action and how to respond. Remember when Jesus spoke these words to those who were gathered on that hillside, it was during Roman occupation. Times were very difficult and hard. To speak words of peace and equality among slaves and free was seen as being a great weakness and extremely difficult given Roman taxes and the situation that surrounded them. They were truly radical then and they are truly radical now. Jesus speaks that the meek will inherit the earth. The peacemakers will be the ones to receive God's mercy and will be called the children of God. The poor in spirit, those who hunger and long for justice, and the merciful, the pure in heart, will receive the gifts of God's coming kingdom and all that that means. We live in a world where that can seem to be weak, but rather Jesus talks about it being strong and it's something the church is called to be. The Latin word, beatus, blessed, good news, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the peacemakers, means good news. Good news to the poor in spirit, good news to those who mourn, for they shall see God. The Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes in in particular, as Tom Wright records in his commentary, are a summon to live in the present, in the way that will make sense in God's promised future because the future had arrived in the presence of Jesus of Nazareth. Peace, Kenneth Bailey on his comment in, uh, on Matthew 5 also writes, the peace is often limited to the absence of war or the sensation of violence. But peace in the Bible includes the finest of loving, kind relationships between individuals within families, communities and nations. Peace also includes good health. The peace discussed here is primarily the peace of God, which includes all of the above and passes all understanding. Jesus, interestingly, uses the word peacemaker as opposed to peaceful or the word that would be used for pacifists. To be a peacemaker is something active. Is it any wonder that Jesus said that those who will be called to be peacemakers would be truly called the children of God for doing God's will. Peacemakers called children of God. When I reflected on the word children of God, it brought me back to Ephesians again. And another element that we as a group reflected on, that we are called to be members of the household of God, built together into one spiritual building. If we are truly members of the household of God, disciples of Jesus Christ, We are called to be peacemakers, for we are the children of God. Another question, what does it mean for a household to look like if we are peacemakers together? Ephesians, again, talks about peace many times. And today is the festival of Christ the King. It's Advent Sunday, next Sunday. That's got a bit lost, I think, in the discussions listening to the Prime Minister about whether Christmas will happen or not. Christmas will happen, and it's Advent Sunday, next Sunday. That will not change whatever happens with COVID-19. And today is the day before Advent Sunday when we think about Jesus as King of the Nations. The message of the angels that we will begin to reflect on from next weekend will remain the same. For we welcome the arrival of the Prince of Peace in such humble beginnings. The angels say, on earth peace amongst those whom he favours, as we prepare to welcome the infant Jesus, the Prince of Peace. That marvellous words to the angels on the hill, to the shepherds, to await and the promise of he who would change the world. We often read that passage in Isaiah 9 at our carol services. 
and will again this year, where we're reminded that the Prince of Peace is the wonderful counsellor, the mighty God and the Prince of Peace. For Jesus is our peace, as we're reminded in Ephesians. He is the one who enables the peacemakers, for he is the King of Peace, the one who stands at the heart. Ephesians reminds us that he is the one who brings people together, for he is the cornerstone, the one who holds the entire building up. He takes down walls that divide and hostility that would tear people apart, for belief and trust in him is the glue that holds us together. I wonder how deep-rooted your peace is in Jesus Christ. I've been struck during lockdown by the story time and time again and reminded by others about the story of Jesus in the boat in the storm with the disciples. And it struck me recently that the disciples were afraid in the boat. It just makes, helps me with humanity, really, that if they were afraid, so we can give ourselves permission to feel afraid in the midst of the storm. For even with him in the centre of the boat, they felt afraid of the waves. But he is the stillness in the storm. He is the peace at the heart that we need. For he stands up in the boat and the waves stop and the sea goes calm. It's perfectly human to be afraid of the unknown. But sometimes, and particularly at this moment in our history, I think we need to be reminded, as we think about being peacemakers, that he is the peace at the centre of the storm and that will not change. Ephesians reminds us that he is our peace. Ephesians verse 15, the passage reminds us that he makes peace as well as being peace and the source of peace. In his reconciling work of the cross, he makes peace with human, humanity between God and humankind. That our past can be forgiven, that we can be renewed and restored time and time again. For that love and peace never runs out and the mercy at the heart of the Christian message. Verse 17 in Ephesians reminds us that he proclaims peace to all who are far and to those who are near. He brings peace to you today. He enables us to be peacemakers in his name because he comes to proclaim peace to all people as promised by the angels to the shepherds. Ephesians talks about Jesus as the cornerstone being the source of our peace. For he is the one who holds the whole structure together. He enables us to know forgiveness, to be forgiven, and to forgive others in his name. So do you know that deep peace of Christ in your boat of life as you sail through the storm, enabling you to be a peacemaker? The deep peace of Christ that we're given as a gift to share with others, I think is so often dimmed by anxiety, fear or doubt. I know that in my own life, I'm not being glib in any sense of the word. I've known my own peace dimmed by those experiences. But I'm just, I just call you today and myself that sometimes when we feel anxiety overwhelming us, we need to root deep, deep within the love of Christ. Go back to the one that you first met when you first encountered Jesus. And if you've not met with him, why not ask him to meet with you? It's a brave question, but I do believe he will come if you ask him to come to speak to you. Go back to that place of depth. Relight your place of deep peace, found in knowing and walking with Christ through your discipleship on a regular basis. That might be that we need to renew it. It might be we need to make space for it to grow and develop as we go on our discipleship journey. But the abide and trust that Jesus is with us in the storm is the peace that enables us to be peacemakers. During lockdown, I've read lots of books, some lighter, some not so light. I've been reading Rowan Williams' book, The Way of St. Benedict, the last few weeks. It's actually surprisingly light and very interesting and very informative. This is related to peace. If you don't know about St. Benedict, he was born into a world of great violence. The fall of Rome in 410 AD, 
the, about the end of the Western Empire, and Italy at the time was raged by war. The sixth century, when St. Benedict wrote, was characterized by danger, dissolution of population, and many, many social problems. And the rule of St. Benedict, given to the monastic communities and followed by many since then, shaped the development of monastic life throughout Western Christendom. St. Benedict's vision was of a community of love, of balance, and of peace, preferring nothing to the love of Christ. The rule of St. Benedict, I thought this was quite interesting, includes no gossip, envy, hatred, and for the brothers to make the priority of peacemaking amongst them as they lived together in Christian community. Number 70 in the rule of St. Benedict instructs them to pray for one another's enemies in the love of Christ. 71, to make peace within one's enemy before the sun sets. 72, never to despair in the mercy of God, for it is always present. Rowan Williams in that book writes that peacemaking is more than a commitment to reconciling those at odds. It is a deeper, more profound act that we have to choose to engage with. It is a commitment to a currency, a habit of determination that we will live as at peace with one another and for the greater good of our communities and those around us. So some questions for you to think about on the subject of peace. And they will be on the screen, though Debs will send them out in communications for us to consider over the next week. How can we be seen to be people of peace in our communities, families and churches? How can we be seen to be people of peace in our communities, families and churches? And number two, when have you noticed the quiet work of peacemakers? When have you noticed the quiet work of peacemakers? And number three, what does the way ahead look like for our churches, Ruscombe, Twyford and Hurst, our four places of worship, to become dwelling places for the peace of Christ at work? What does the way ahead look like for our churches to become dwelling places? for the peace of Christ at work. Have a think, have a reflect. Make sure you write it down, or when I ask for feedback in a week or so, it would be great to have some feedback on this, your reflections and thoughts. They don't need to be super profound. They can be simple but beautiful. Death is sometimes in the most simple but profound insights. I was listening to the broadcast this morning about worship on Radio 4 and that great hymn, Great as Thy Faithfulness, was sung. I'd forgotten that line, pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. It fits in with my thoughts this week, really. What does it mean to have that peace that endureth? Peace that the world cannot take away, despite all that goes on around us. And when we find that place of deep peace in knowing Christ as our friend and our saviour, how does that enable us to be peacemakers to our friends and neighbours and our communities, especially at this time? In a few minutes after our prayers, Lois and the group are going to sing Cornerstone. I didn't plan this at the beginning, but this song really resonates with me as to that theme in Ephesians about Jesus as the heart of our peace as the cornerstone of our shared life together. And one line of the song says, When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone. So prayer to end with. Go forth in the world to be people of peace. Be of good courage, hold fast and hard to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil, look to strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, 
honour everyone, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, and may God bless and keep us always. Amen.